Bonjour à toutes et à tous, je suis très heureuse de vous retrouver pour cette dernière conférence de la deuxième journée de cet add 2020 qui donc se déroule pour la première fois en live. Euh, pour ceux qui ne me connaîtraient pas, je suis Mnery et pour ceux qui me connaîtraient, euh, vous savez que euh, je suis euh, extrêmement heureuse de pouvoir présenter cette conférence puisque pour cette dernière conférence de cette deuxième journée, donc, on accueille Arvi Tekari. Arvi Tekari, c'est donc le créateur de Baba Is You et Arvi Tekari, euh, pour information, est finlandais. Euh, donc, donc cette conversation, enfin cette conversation, toute la conférence et la, les questions-réponses qui en découleront ensuite seront en anglais. Voilà, je tenais à poser ça là, car justement, oui, il y aura une session de questions-réponses. Donc si jamais euh, ça vous intéresse et que vous avez des questions à poser, eh bien euh, les modérateurs euh, dans le chat se feront un plaisir euh, de pouvoir les... Euh, de pouvoir les récupérer et nous les transmettre. Mais s'il vous plaît, veillez à ce que les questions soient posées en anglais. C'est parti Hi Arvi, how are you uh Hello there. Uh, I'm fine. I'm fine. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I was actually asking uh, if you wanted to introduce yourself, but as you told me before, you are going to do it very well with your presentation. So if you are ready, we could just jump in. All right. Uh, let's start. Let's get started. I'll I'll introduce myself as part of the presentation, and we'll we'll go with that. So Perfect. thank you very much, and uh, let's get going. Okay, wrong. Uh, here we go. This is the title screen. All right. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm Arvid Ekari, and I will be talking about uh, designing the game Baba Is You, uh, which is a game game I made. Uh, so, here's a little su summary of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, I'll, as mentioned, I'll introduce myself uh, quickly. And also, I'll introduce the game Baba Is You, just in case there are some people who might not have heard of it or do not know how it works. Uh, after that, I will explain kind of some of the development process of Baba Is You, and finally talk about uh, the design of Baba Is You and uh, the fifth thing there, the nice things about Baba Is You, kind of explain how Baba Is You's design has helped help the game or made it made it something that I am now talking about here like what what is the what is the reason why someone asked me to talk talk here about baba is you i guess anyway so Although that's uh, because it's a it's a great game you, you mean <laughs> <laughs> thank you I'll, i'll try to mention that uh i'll be using some tools to check my time because i have a bad habit of talking a little bit too much so uh if i I'll tab every now and then, uh, my apologies. I've, I'm just checking the time so that I don't go over time. Anyway, let's get started. So uh, who am I? Uh, as mentioned, I'm Arvi Teikari. I'm a Finnish game developer based in Helsinki, Finland. Finland, uh, I guess, yeah, Finland, Finland. Uh, I've been making games since primary school. Uh, a schoolmate introduced me to uh, the program called Game Maker in primary school and asked me if I want to make games, although I had already wanted to make games even before that like my cousin had a super nintendo when i was in in the kindergarten and that already kind of gave me this inspiration of wanting to make my own games uh, but as a kid uh as a like a, I, i spoke only finnish at that point or i understood english very badly so game maker for example had had Like a, I, you had to understand a lot of English to be able to use it, and also because I was a primary schooler, I was a uh, too impatient to learn how to use it. So uh, after using Game Maker for some time, I moved on to a different program which I've, I've been using since. So it's it's kind of like a the being young enough to not have the patience to learn things and not to be able to talk English kind of affected my game creation hobby quite a lot. And uh, for the first several years of, of my game development hobby, I just made small freeware experimental games. I'm very proud of them. They were cool, but they were many of them were made in like just a week or for a game jam in like two days and so on. Uh, they were a really good kind of basis for what will be coming next, for example, Baba Is You. 
but they were not like uh, they were not like commercial hits or I, I wasn't like a successful game developer back then in that sense. Also, uh, in 2010, I think I went for my first physical game jam. So game jams are these events where people go somewhere or hang around on the in the internet and uh, make games under a, a time limit, usually uh, 48 hours. And uh, game jams have been very important for me because they are often events where I can kind of take an idea I have in my head or a new idea I get during the game jam and just kind of try it out, make a prototype, see if it works. And if it doesn't work, I don't have to worry about it. The game jam ended, I can just throw it away or leave it on the back of my head and return to it later. Or if I figure out something cool, then I can maybe make it into a big game or like a proper full release. And uh, two of the main game jams, physical game jams I've been participating in have been No More Sweden. Uh, the name is kind of uh, rough sounding, but it's a Swedish, Swedish game jam. Uh, also Nordic Game Jam, which I think is might still be the largest annual game jam in the world. Also Ludum Dare, which is an online only game jam. And uh, on top of these, free freeware experimental games and game jams. Uh, I slowly developed my hobby into an actual career and I released my first commercial title, Environmental Station Alpha in 2015, and then Baba is You in 2019, and which is, yeah, I, I'll be talking about that mostly uh, for the rest of the presentation. And uh, as the final point there, as mentioned, because I didn't have the patience or the language skills to really get into actual proper programming as a kid, I stuck to tools that don't require programming and I, and I still use those kinds of tools. And Baba is You actually was made uh, with a tool like that, although I, uh, complemented with the Lua scripting language. Anyway, so what is Baba is You in, uh, in that? Then I'll check my time. Uh, all right, everything looks fine. Uh, so Baba is You is a turn-based puzzle game it follows the kind of archetype of puzzle games started by Sokoban or popularized by Sokoban. Uh, they're usually called block pushing games where the idea is that uh, the view is usually top down. It doesn't have to be top down, but there's like a grid. There are characters on the grid and they can move freely on the grid. There are walls and there are some kind of boxes or rocks or something that can be pushed around. And the original, the Sokoban game, uh, which is Japanese for a warehouse, I think the idea is that you are a kind of a warehouse warden or warehouse keeper and you have to organize the warehouse. So the idea of the original Sokoban is that you have these boxes and you have marked spots for these boxes and you have to push those boxes onto those marked spots. And when every marked spot has a box, you win the level. There have been a lot of puzzle games, uh, especially over the past like 10 years or five years that have taken this Sokoban concept and uh, kind of built upon it, uh, kind of uh, taken new looks at the concept, made it more interesting. The original Sokoban is a very simplistic game. You literally only have the character, the boxes, the spots where the boxes go and walls, and that's all of it. And when you add more difficult puzzles, they very quickly follow the logic of being just like more complicated, be larger, having more moving pieces. They, there are no like big aha moments to be had after a certain point in Sokoban. It's mostly just kind of increasing complexity. And I, I feel that some of these more recent puzzle games have taken some really interesting looks at the idea and introduced more of these kind of aha moments, these interesting surprises. Some of my favorites are listed here. Uh, they include games such as Stephen Sausage Roll, Snakebird, A Good Snowman is Hard to Build. Uh, also Puzzle Script, which is not a single game, but a scripting language for making these kinds of puzzle games. Also some games that I, I always forget to, or I have used to forget to mention in these situations, but I would still want to mention are uh, Pipe Push Paradise and uh, Hiding Spot by Corey Martin. Uh, both of those are also really good uh, block pushing games uh, that I kind of want to introduce to people where, wherever possible. Uh, so Baba is You is one of these block pushing games. And uh, similarly to those games that I just mentioned, it also takes a, like a new twist to the basic idea of pushing blocks. 
in Baba is You, the twist is that there are words that are also, also pushable blocks. So you have these word blocks in the game world. And uh, these words can form sentences. At the basis of, basis of the game are like three word sentences. So you say, for example, the name Baba is you is one of those sentences you can form in the game as well. And these sentences define and change the rules of the game. So for example, if you have the blocks Baba is you next to each other, you form the rule Baba is you. And what it means is that Baba, this creature that moves around in the game, is you, the player. So you control Baba. You could also say, for example, wall is stop which means that walls, a different kind of object in the game, uh, are stop. You cannot move through them. Or flag is win, which means that the flag that you can also find in the levels is the win condition. And uh, the interesting thing about Baba is You, on top of this whole uh, rule forming thing, is that uh, there are many objects. There are flags, rocks, walls. There's a creature Baba. There are different other creatures, many different things. And if you don't have any of these word blocks, if you don't have any of those rules coming out of the words, then almost nothing does anything. You have to have these rules that are actually in the level to give meaning to the game. Uh, there are some intrinsic rules, but those are very uh, kind of, uh, they are not super important for the basic idea of the game. There are some kind of basic systems so the game has this interesting thing where, for example, if you have the, this wall, uh, usually you might say wall is stop because usually in the world walls are something that you cannot move through. But if you have these walls and you don't have any rules relating to walls, then the walls are nothing. They're just they're just decorations. And that uh, Baba kind of plays with this idea. I will be talking about that a little bit more later. Uh, the game, as as mentioned earlier. In Sokoban, many of the puzzles were kind of less about these aha moments of realization and more about like complexity and like seeing the level and understanding the order in which you have to move things to solve, solve it. And in Baba is You, the puzzles are more about this, these aha moments. I wanted to make as many puzzles where you have to have some kind of like a realization. Uh, and uh, one let's player call this insight based puzzles and i really like that word i think baba is you is a very insight based puzzle game at least i try to make it so and uh, i will be talking about the level or i will be mentioning the level editor later again but there, there's coming a level editor i don't know why i have it have that there that's not really important for anything uh to kind of i have some pictures here to illustrate the idea even better so if my explanation by, by words is not making any sense, then maybe these pictures can help kind of contextualize the idea of Baba is you. So here we have the rule, Baba is you, the three words, that's my mouse, Baba is you, and then the creature Baba there. So with this rule, as mentioned, I would now be able to control Baba. I could move around yeah, with Baba, uh, because Baba is now the player kind of. Uh, then we could have a, have a situation like this, where there's uh, kind of a square made out of walls, and we have the rule, wall is stop. Inside the walls, there's flag is win and the flag. Let's assume that uh, Baba is you, the rule is somewhere out of you. So we have Baba here, Baba is the main character, we are controlling, controlling Baba, but we cannot get to the flag, we cannot win because there's the, this uh, square of walls around. So what we can do is we can break the rule. We can destroy the wall is stop rule so that it's no longer aligned, which means that now, long, now the walls are no longer anything. So we can move through the walls with Baba. That's kind of a very basic concept of Baba is you. As an, another example, we could have the same situation. Wall is stop, flag is win. The flag is inside the walls. Baba is somewhere here. Let's assume that Baba is just kind of hanging around out of view. And then we have the rule, Baba is you. So one thing we could also do, instead of just breaking the wall is stop rule, we could say wall is stop and wall is you. So now Baba, the creature, would no longer be you. It would no longer be the player. Baba would be just like a decoration doing nothing. And instead, all these walls would be you, the player. So here in this illustration, 
the walls have become you and they have moved to the right twice. So now the wall is touching the flag and the level is one. So that's kind of, this is maybe a bit more interesting explain, uh, kind of an example of what the, why the puzzle system in Baba is you is so interesting. Uh, anyway, next I'll explain the development process. This is not really related to the themes of the presentations. I'll check my time again and uh, hopefully this won't take too much time because the design is the actually in, uh, well, interesting I, I, part. I did check time. We have uh, Neil McCormack in the chat saying mm -hmm. that uh, uh, this is some elegant design. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm glad if you feel that way. It's, uh, it's definitely, I've tried to make puzzle games for a long time. Ever since I played the game Braid uh, in 2008, I think I've been really uh, wishing to figure out some kind of a cool puzzle idea with this kind of inside-based puzzling. And it's been very tough. I've run into some design problems every single time. And Baba Isu is kind of my one of my first times where I've really feel, felt that, okay, this is, a, this is an actually cool idea. I want to do as much as I can with this concept. It and it's been very rewarding as I will probably be mentioning later as well when I discuss the development of the game. But thank you very much for that comment. So uh, in 2017, I was at the Nordic Game Jam I mentioned earlier. It's uh, held in April every year. This year, there was also like a game jam, but obviously it was not a physical game jam because of the COVID situation. So I was at Co in Copenhagen uh, and uh, in Nordic Game Jam, the idea is that you get a theme. You don't have to follow the theme very closely, but there's still a theme you could use as your inspiration and you have 48 hours to finish a game. And the theme was not there. Uh, I considered a theme. I actually had come to the Game Jam mostly to meet friends and have like a relaxed time. I had some other game projects I wanted to work on. So I, I actually didn't really think that I was possibly going to make any game for the jam. I was more in it for the social interaction, uh, which is really nice at like physical game jams if you have a good at atmosphere. But when I thought about the theme, the not there, I started thinking how, like I concentrated on the word not. And uh, it kind of reminded me how in logic, you can, ha you can have some concept concept x let's just say concept x and you can reverse the meaning of x by saying not x usually denoted by random symbols depending on the logic system being used and that kind of it's a pretty simple like obviously yeah you can say happy not happy to reverse the meaning of happy or sad not sad uh, but then I had played some block pushing puzzle games recently before that, so, such as the a Good Snowman is Hard to Build, uh, most recently, I think. Uh, and I kind of like this inspiration from my past failures at puzzle games, these block pushing games I had played recently, also Stephen Sausage Rolls, or Sausage Roll is a very good puzzle, block pushing game, or Snake Bird. This inspiration is coming from these other puzzle games inspiration from my past attempts and this logic concept kind of combined in my head and gave me, after like considering it for some time, I don't remember the process anymore, it's been uh, three years, but after like some consideration, I had this mental image of there being a pool of lava, like hot lava, and there being blocks of ice. And uh, the ice would melt in the lava, obviously, because the lava is hot, the ice is cold. But I had this mental idea of the image of there being a statement, ice is not melt, which would mean that the ice does not melt in the lava. And uh, yeah, as mentioned, I don't remember the exact thought process anymore. I'm sad about that. I should have written it down because it would be super cool to be able to relate like the exact, like where did I start, what happened next and so on. But basically, eventually, during the first day of the game jam, I landed in with this idea of like top down block pushing game where you have words and you can say ice is not melt to make the ice not melt. It didn't feel like a very cool idea. It felt like a boring idea. It felt like an idea that would be very difficult to implement that would have like uh, coding problems that might not actually lead to interesting puzzles. As mentioned, I had had many of many failures when trying to make puzzle games. So I was kind of preparing myself to realize that, okay, it doesn't, like the idea doesn't re really lead to anything. But as mentioned also earlier, in game jams, the nice thing is that 
um, you can prototype. I can prototype something. If it doesn't work, I, I don't have to care about it. I can just throw it away or I can reconsider it later. There's very little kind of, uh, kind of responsibility to the ideas I make at the game jam. So I felt that, okay, I'll prototype this. Let's see what happens. And it ended up, ended up working surprisingly well. Uh, and I won the game jam, the Nordic game jam, there's like a vote for best game. So I won the Congrats. best game vote, which was really nice. And kind of that and some encouragement from other game de developers uh, kind of uh, convinced me that, okay, this game has potential. I was still slightly unsure after the game jam, but I like people talked to me about it and uh, that kind of yeah, gave me the confidence to really start making a full game out of it. And I spent two years on it. Uh, the first year was mostly kind of trying things out, seeing what works, adding more words and so on, like uh, getting an idea of what the scope and the style of the game will be. And then there was another year of maybe slightly more focused development where I was making more levels and figuring out the, the exact structure of the game and so on. And uh, in 2018, uh, I participated in the Independent Games Festival award ceremony and Baba is you won some awards there. This gave me extra confidence. Also, I started collaborating with the uh, Danish company MP2 Games for uh, bringing Baba is you to more platforms. Because as mentioned earlier, I, after my childhood, I stuck with non-programming tools. This Multimedia Fusion 2 program that is a fairly old, doesn't require any programming knowledge, but it, it's surprisingly powerful. I, I was able to make Baba is you with that and some. Lua script help. But the problem with Multimedia Fusion 2 is that it's not very good for porting to different platforms. So MP2 games helped me with being able to bring Baba is You to the Nintendo Switch, the uh, Macintosh and the Linux platforms, which was super helpful because I, it would have been a huge shame to only be able to release on Windows. And there were some other problems as well to consider. And uh, yeah, so I spent two years. I was planning to release the game in late 2018, but as usually happens with game development, I missed that date and uh, I finally released it in March 2019. And uh, a nice thing about this belated release was that I was actually able to add some fun extra features to the final version. And so in the end, I'm happy that it took some extra time. And uh, I guess I guess I've written again that I we are releasing a level editor in 2020. I guess I've been really excited about that feature. I think the level editor might be mentioned once more at the end of the presentation. So uh, be prepared for reading the word words level editor once more uh, during this presentation. Good. Anyway, uh, I'll be checking the time again. Uh, looks pretty okay. It's uh, really so okay. let's move. Yeah. Uh, so let's move to the actual topic of the. Uh, kind of presentation. I'm, I'm happy that I, it only took me 25 minutes to get to the actual point. Uh, when I was giving my first presentation about Baba Is You, I had one and a half hours. And uh, when I had only 10 minutes or five minutes left, I was getting to the point of my presentation. So that this is going better. Uh, so Baba Is You's design. As mentioned, I was very uncertain about many parts of the game uh, when I like after the game jam. I won the game jam, so evidently there was potential in the game. People liked the game, but I was still um, I was still conflicted because at game jams, when you make a prototype, it's sometimes hard to say if the result is something that works as a game jam game, as a small experimental thing, or if it can actually work as a full commercial release. There, there are some differences. For example, a game jam game can be fun, uh, on its own, but the idea might be very short-lived. So when you have seen the idea, it gets less interesting very quickly, and then it doesn't really support a full game. Uh, things like that kind of were in my head, and I was unsure. I got a lot of very positive feedback from developer friends. I remember that after the game jam, uh, if I remember correctly, we went to eat together with a group of friends, and people kind of wanted to talk with me about the game, game and so on, and that kind of made me think, that, okay, maybe it's not just like my imagination or maybe it's, this is not like a fluke. Maybe there's actually potential in this idea. I'll try to make a full game out of it. And I was really happy about that this decision. Um, I have my points slightly in the wrong order here. So I want to talk about this next. So with Baba is You, uh, since there's this rule changing mechanic, 
there's a lot of the, the engine supports this kind of toying around with the words quite a lot. There's a lot of kind of funny situations you can have. For example, the example I gave earlier, the wall is you, is something that is just kind of fun to do. It doesn't have to be a puzzle. It doesn't have to be like something that you've spent a long time thinking about. Just kind of the fact that you can say wall is you and become the wall is funny and interesting in its, on its own. So after the game jam, I was conflicted. Should I make kind of a sandbox thing? Should I make a, a like a toy where people can, people can add their own words and try out different combinations and see what happens? Or should I make a actual puzzle game, a hardcore puzzle game, which was my kind of initial idea? Because I could make a game that is fun to toy with so people can maybe like make their own little contraptions. Or I could make a difficult puzzle game that would make them more niche, but would maybe explore the potential of the idea more deeply. And I felt that these ideas would, would be very difficult to combine because very different kinds of players are interested in one or the other. And uh, I spent some time considering this, but ultimately I decided that I would like to make a, a more difficult puzzle game instead of a more like sandbox experience, uh, mostly because I personally enjoy puzzle games and difficult puzzle games. For example, Stephen Sausage Roll and Snake Bird that I mentioned earlier are both very difficult puzzle games and I like them a lot. So I maybe felt that I wanted to do something similar instead of maybe like going slightly against my uh, usual design approach and try to make a sandbox. Because if I tried to make something that was kind of not my style in a way, the end result might be weaker. And uh, there's also the kind of a, a question of uh, what to do with the game's story. Would I want to make, many puzzle games are very abstract. The original Sokoban has kind of a setting. You're a warehouse organizer, you organize a warehouse, but the basic concept is still like, there are walls here and there, there are boxes here and there, there's a character, there's very little context. And puzzle games don't really maybe need context in many, in many cases, but there are also some puzzle games that do have a context and that people have liked maybe more because of the context. For example, there's the game Talos Principle, which I actually haven't played, but it deals a lot with kind of, uh, with some philosophical themes. There's also the game The Swapper uh, from 2012, I think, uh, or 2013, which also deals with like concepts of consciousness and moving consciousness. And uh, I feel that if you have a good, story or like setting that fits the game then it will improve the game but if you have a bad story or if the story is i don't know like too melodramatic to something uh compared to the puzzle idea then it might backfire you might get like a like it might might feel just awkward instead of interesting so i was conflicted about that as well and actually one person contacted me about wanting to write the story for Baba is You. And uh, during this initial feedback from developer friends, some, some of our developer friends also mentioned that Baba is You's idea gave them, made me think of like consciousness. Because in Baba is You, when you say Baba is You and you control the creature Baba, technically you give Baba consciousness. Baba now is the player. And when you move that to something else, the kind of consciousness moves to a different object and uh, some of my developer friends uh, ask, asked me if I had intentionally kind of uh, wanted to explore this kind of system. I hadn't, I just made a puzzle game but they still uh, talked with me about it and this person who wanted to make a story for Baba you also had maybe some ideas about this kind of consciousness, moving consciousness uh, and wanted to like write a story for Baba you centered around that. Ultimately, I decided to work on the story on my own. And I decided that I wouldn't want to have like some kind of like, uh, I don't know, cutscenes or something like that, uh, or have thing people talk, have Baba like voice their opinions about things because I felt that I'm not a very good storyteller. I don't want to take the risk of spoiling everything with a bad story, but I still wanted to have some kind of a setting, some kind of a context, and that affected my design decisions later. Uh, on top of these conflicts, there's also things like graphics and marketability, uh, how to do the audio. I, I usually want to do things on my own, so I ended up 
wanting to do those graphics on my own and this app, the audio on my own. I had never done audio for a commercial title before, so it was a fun self-imposed challenge. Many of these were just like, there were good options available and I felt that maybe I should take these good options and then I decided that, oh, no, I want to do this myself. I'll use the bad option and hope that it works. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of about the design of the game as a product or and the like first steps of the design. And uh, the rest of this slide will be more about the kind of design of the game when it comes to the levels. So when I started making the levels for Baba Is You, as mentioned, I wanted to have these kind of insight-based puzzles because for me, the most interesting puzzles in other puzzle games have been insight-based where you have to realize something new. You can't just use the, the rules you already know about the game system to solve a puzzle, uh, just kind of moving things around. You have to figure out some kind of a new implication of those rules you know, or some kind of new interaction. And I wanted Baba Is You to be about that. And I felt that Baba Is You had a lot of potential for that kind of puzzle design. So when I started designing puzzles, I obviously, I had different words and I added new words. For example, I added the, there's a word push. You can say rock is pushed to make rocks pushable. There's a word shift. You can say belt is shift to have like a conveyor belt or uh, well, so on. There's a lot of different words. Because I think, when like, you, maybe. Sorry, when yeah. you thought about the words, you thought about the words in English directly. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, my thought process when designing games is mostly in English because I've just used English so, so much. I kind of started from English. I actually tried to make a Finnish translation of Baba Is You on my own at one point and it failed horribly because I'm not a good translator from English to Finnish. All right. So yeah, so I had these words and usually when trying to figure out level ideas, I consider the words I already had and word ideas I had in my head that I hadn't implemented yet or and maybe like new ideas that I could implement. And I tried to figure out interesting interactions between them or like interesting implications of those words that I hadn't considered before. And when I got some kind of a cool interaction between words, interaction of one word with kind of itself or the like basic systems of the world, or maybe like a new implication of a word, uh, I then tried to think of what kind of a level design I have to have so that this implication is necessary for the solution. To give an example, I mentioned this belt is shift rule where you can have these belts that point in one direction some direction and when something is on top of them it gets pushed in that direction so they work like conveyor belts and at one point i consider the like implications of this shift word what does it mean and i realized that if i would have a situation where there's a belt that is shift and another belt on top of that belt the implication of that situation would be that one belt pushes the other because it shifts, but the other belt also pushes the first belt. So they would like both move together as like a autonomous entity. And that was like, oh yeah, that, that seems cool. That's a cool implication that doesn't really, like when you think of conveyor belts, you don't really think of like two conveyor belts being on top of each other and pushing each other together. But with Baba Is You's rule system, that made sense. It was a direct re uh, kind of result of how the shift word works, but it, it was kind of like a, it required a realization. So I made a puzzle around that. And that's, a, I think, my most common example of what kind of insights I built Baba's levels around. So for example, when I had this idea, I then felt, thought like, what kind of a level do I, could I make where having this belt on belt system uh, would be necessary for the solution. And the level I made was such that you have to move some words in one corner of the level, but at the same time, you have to be in a very different corner of the level. So you set up this belt on belt system. It slowly moves its way to add one corner. In the meantime, Baba moves in the other corner. So when the belts do whatever, whatever they do in one corner, then Baba is already in the other corner and is able to win the level. Sorry, a little bit of water. So yeah, uh, related to these inside-based puzzles and the kind of 
potential I felt that Baba is Use concept had based on this feedback from testers and other game developers and like, uh, in general, how people had reacted and what I felt about the game idea. I wanted to explore the design space of Baba is You as deeply as possible because I felt that Baba is You was a very novel concept. It had a lot of potential and it would have felt bad if I had just kind of thought of a couple of words, made levels, as many levels I can, I can think of around those words and left it at that. And uh, as mentioned earlier, I kind of spent the first year of, game, of the game's development just kind of uh, thinking of different things. And the second year I spent kind of concentrating on what I had and like finalizing things. But I also spent the second year kind of considering like, how could I explore this idea even deeper and that led into some very important additions to the game's kind of the final game goes into the systems of the game. Uh, I'll check my time at this point. Uh, looks pretty okay. And uh, to give an example of this kind of more meta uh, design that I felt that I feel I figured out by spending more time consider, sorry, considering the game, kind of letting the game or these ideas mature in my head. Uh, at one point, um, I thought of the word text, which would mean that when you say, for example, text is you, instead of some object in the game world like baba or wall or rock or flag turning into you, the player, would actually turn the words themselves into you, the player. And this text word was a very good example of kind of a meta concept that is very logical in the context of the game design, uh, but that still required some extra thinking to stumble into. And that I was very happy to realize because I, that was like, oh yes, this explores the idea in a very interesting way. It's a very logical continuation of the con uh, concept but it might have been that I would have, wouldn't have figured that out. And uh, I'm very happy that I did. There are some, even later in the development, like even, even just a couple of weeks before uh, like submitting the game to be released, there were still a couple of new ideas that, I, that kind of came to me that were too good to pass, up, pass on or pass up, I guess. And uh, that I just kind of quickly implemented in a very hacky way because for me, the most important thing was this kind of exploring the idea deeply, as, as deeply as possible. And in some situations, I allowed myself to make some, uh, like to implement something a bit purely, if that meant that I was able to have this, this new interesting concept in the game. Uh, let's see if I can figure out. Well, for example, this is a spoiler for the end parts of the game. So close your ears for a couple of minutes if, if you haven't played the game and intend to play the game. Uh, for example, the game has maps. And on the map, you pick from levels with like a selector. It's like a cursor that you move the arrow keys. And during like final weeks of development, I realized that right now, the selector is something that is kind of outside of the game. It's a special thing that just kind of is on the map screens. It, do, it doesn't really interact with anything but these levels. What if the selector was just like an object, like anything else, and instead of the selector having this kind of intrinsic selector, selector or cursor behavior, what if this behavior was given to it by a rule? I didn't implement such a rule at that point because I didn't have time, but I added a new level or an area for the game where we have the word cursor, which means that you can actually interact with this level selector cursor thing using the rules of the game. It was a very cool idea. I didn't have time to implement it properly, but after release, I returned to it and uh, did some more stuff with it. And that was one of those, another example, maybe a bit smaller than this text example, but still something where I felt that, okay, now I have explored this idea even more deeply and I'm happy about that. Uh, but yeah, so the only, or the big drawback of this kind of approach is that especially with the level editor that I've been mentioning a couple of times now, there are many corner cases 
that I I will never be able to solve. Like if if I want to explore some an idea as deeply as possible, I will in, uh, increase the complexity of the system. I will increase the possible combinations of things, and inevitably there will there will be some combinations of things that don't work out that need to be fixed, or that cannot be fixed without rewriting everything. So yeah, I will. I'm happy that I explored the idea as deeply as possible, but the kind of sacrifice I had to make is that people will be able to make levels that just like explode, and I, I can't do anything about that. It's, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that sacrifice, but it, it's still slightly annoying. <laughs> anyway, so for the final thing, uh, as, as a kind of a summary of what I, why I think Baba is You has been interesting to people, like why, why is Baba is You an interesting game in the opinion of other players or what is the theory how i explain to myself why baba is you has been interesting or getting attention so uh, first of all baba is you has a seemingly a very simplistic and intuitive concept you have a block pushing game many people have played block pushing games so the basic idea of block pushing is familiar to many then this idea of having words that make sentences, that make rules, it's also a fairly simple idea. Like the people ha are used to reading rules. The idea of words forming sentences is also very kind of intuitive to people. So the basic concept feels very simple, uh, even if it's actually it's very complicated and the like game design implications are very complicated, it still feels simple. And this combination of seeming, seemingly simplistic concept combined with a lot of design possibilities, with a lot of design complexity, I think might be intriguing to a lot of people. It's at least very intriguing, intriguing to me as a person, as a game developer. Uh, as a second thing, I feel that in Baba is You, I used the, this example of having wall is stop and then changing that into wall is you to kind of, instead of having walls that are walls, that are solid, that you cannot move through, the walls are in, in, instead you, the player. I think this kind of taking very familiar concepts, people are very used to the idea of walls being solid uh, and changing it to something completely different. People are not used the, to the idea of walls being alive or walls moving around. I think that is something that kind of uh, amuses people, uh, surprises people. Uh, when I was at Nordic Game Jam in 2017, I, and I showcased the very first Game Jam version, which is actually available for free on each IO if you're interested in checking it out. Uh, I, I noticed that many of the interactions I showed to people made people laugh in kind of amusement or surprise. And that was a very good kind of example for me of like, oh, this idea that you can change how things work, that they don't no longer work how people expect them to work is something that people find intriguing. And that's kind of, I think that's very important for the kind of design of Baba or why Baba's design is interesting. Uh, also, there's the, uh, once more, exploring the premise, premise as deeply as possible. Uh, I think this is more mostly interesting for people who actually play the game like fully through, who experience the whole, uh, the, like entire content of the game. Uh, but for those people, I think the game might be interesting also because they see that oh, there's this implication of, as well. I understood this set of implications, but now the game introduces one more implication. That's cool. Like this kind of having as many implications of the game system explored is maybe interesting to some players. Uh, and finally, finally, I feel that the kind of, even though I ended up making a puzzle game, a very difficult puzzle game, uh, the game still has some like playfulness, especially in the early levels. You can have a lot of different solutions, even like unintended solutions. Uh, you can break the levels in many ways. You can break the rule wall is stop and just go to the flag instead of doing something else. And this kind of playful nature, being able to try different things and see what happens, especially in the early levels. The later levels are more strict because they have to be more difficult than in many situations these unintended alternative solutions maybe make things a bit too easy uh, for like a fire end game level. But in, the, in these early parts, this playfulness, this ability to toy around has been amusing to many players. And I think that's a, one of the strengths of the game. 
And uh, yeah, as I promised, there's one once more the word level editor. I think there was actually one one extra uh, level editor somewhere there, but uh, yeah, there's a level editor coming, and that will allow people to play around with the words even more. Uh, if if you suddenly start thinking of the words level editor later on today, I apologize. That's my that's my fault at this point. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's it. Thank you very, very much for uh, listening to this presentation. And I think now we might have uh, we, some questions. Yeah, we shall move on to the questions. Okay, I will just uh, uh, let you uh, turn down the um, uh, turn off. Sorry, uh, the the screen uh, share, and so uh, okay, we yeah, can have our webcams that. again. So I'm, actually, you, you've had a lot of questions during the presentation, just so you know. Oh, no. um, <laughs> before we move on to this, I had one question. Uh, this is mine, actually. So I just uh, uh, allow myself to, to ask it first, because this is something, uh, you know, people have been uh, gently arguing about this. Um, what kind of creature is Baba? Oh, uh... is, it, is, it, is it an existing animal? Because it, it, it looks like, you know, uh, uh, some people say it's a bunny, some people say it's a cat. Uh, well, I guess the official answer is that I, I made it intentionally uh, ambigu ambiguous. So the, I, I like it how people have inter interpreted Baba as many different things. I've seen goat, bunny, elephant, dog, cat, hamster, uh, capybara, I think at, at least those, maybe some more. Uh, as a kind of a small small story related to this, when I made the first Game Jam version, Baba was actually a robot. And that's how I saw this small sprite I made for Baba there. And then a game developer friend of mine, Jason Boyer, made fan art of that version of Baba, where they interpreted this robot Baba as a goat person, because Baba was like a bipedal robot with antennae. And Jason interpreted those antennae as horns. And when I saw this piece of fan art, I felt that, okay, I want to do this cute animal approach for Baba. And that actually changed my, how I felt I wanted to approach the graphics in general. I wanted to make a very cute game after that. And so I made Baba this blobby creature, not really a goat person because I didn't want to steal Jason's idea, like just, just like that. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want to copy the idea they had, but I still wanted to have this like cute animal creature and I felt that it fits the idea of the game where you change the rules that Baba is kind of like a nondescript animal. So uh, I, unfortunately, it's undecided. Baba is what you all want right. Baba to be. It's a creature. That's why you call this. You call it this way, I guess. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, the first question is from Igor. And um, this is related to game design. Uh, why is the rule text is push always true, but never written? Uh, yeah, well, that's that has a kind of a not, not complicated answer, but answer that has multiple steps. So uh, when I started making the game, my first assumption, uh, well, okay, my very first assumption with this like lava and ice thing I mentioned was that some things could have intrinsic rules, like ice would be meltable by default, lava would be hot by default. I s scrapped that idea very soon because I thought it would be cooler if they have no uh, rules by default. But I felt at that point that text, these words, would be the exceptions. They, have, they could have intrinsic rules because they, can, they are kind of outside of the game world. They are like in their own plane of existence. Then uh, as I worked on the game, some testers pointed out that uh, some of the implications of the text being kind of outside of this world, for example, text wouldn't interact with certain rules uh, in the way other objects would. And testers pointed out that it's confusing to have to learn, like, in we, like if you can push text around, why is the text not affected by certain rules? And they felt that it would be better if the text would kind of be in the game world, just like all the other objects. And instead I would do something else to kind of differentiate in situations where that is necessary which led to me changing the behavior of text. But because the pushability of the text is kind of a fundamental thing that is required in every single level, and also because the word text is something 
that is maybe a bit too complicated to introduce to the player from the very get-go. Uh, like it's very intuitive that you can push around the words, but if you had the word rule, text is pushed in the very first level, that could be confusing for a player because it's, they don't really have to understand the word text is pushed. They only need to understand that you can push the text. I kind of decided that, okay, maybe I'll allow it that text is pushed is one of those intrinsic rules and then later introduce the word text so that the player doesn't have to kind of take in so much uh, so like at the very beginning of the game so I can kind of ease them in more slowly so it's kind of a hacky solution in a way it kind of breaks the purity of the design of the game but I think it's it was a good compromise fine uh, we have an um... Uh, another question, uh, which is from Litum, Lytham, sorry if I uh, mispronounce it. Uh, do you attend Ludum Dare? If yes, uh, do you have a link uh, to your to your uh, LD46 entry? Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, I think it was last weekend, a week ago, there was the Ludum Dare. I mentioned it's an online only game jam where you make games either in 48 hours or 72 hours. Uh, Ludum Dare has been super important for me over the years, but I didn't participate in the latest. I was kind of busy busy with other stuff and I didn't have really have inspiration, so I, I skipped this, uh, this time, uh, which is kind of a shame. Ludum Dare used to be organized four times a year. Nowadays, it's only two times a year, so skipping one uh, means that I have to wait until autumn, but yeah, that's that's what happened. Sorry about that. Another question from Adrien, who asks, uh, what is your intellectual process designing an advanced puzzle level of Baba is You? In other words, how to start a great level with this odd design and all the possibilities and deadlocks? Uh, so, I, I, so I assume the question is kind of, how do I start designing a level? I guess. Yeah. How I think. Uh, how how did you how did you come to uh, to the press? Actually, you 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 kind of described it at the uh, at the beginning of your presentation, I guess, uh, if I remember correctly. But is I think he he means um, um, how how to design a. Uh, what what was the process that led you to to design that adv those advanced levels? Uh, yeah, I'd say that the process that I described in the presentation was kind of uh, with me throughout the whole whole time. And some of the most complicated puzzles still follow the same idea because I had this kind of, this interaction is cool. What kind of level do I have to make so that this interaction is required? And with more complicated interactions, I had to have more complicated levels that with more kind of restrictions so that kind of alternative solutions that don't uh, use that interaction uh, are not valid and it's also like in later levels because i wanted to in general make the solutions more specific to avoid uh, the player being able to kind of break the levels to, with like trivial solutions every single time uh, the kind of same design process applied even even at the end so yeah it's I, there were definitely many different situations for designing the puzzle. Some ideas that just kind of, kind of came to me. Some I tried several times before I found something useful. But the basic concept was mostly that this kind of, I have this interaction, this concept. How do I kind of reverse engineer a level that requires that concept? I, I, I think that's a pretty good answer. I think so, too. Um, there is another question from uh, Schmupixel. Uh, asking how long did it take from the game jam prototype to the first version to the first version so you would consider as more than a proof of concept uh, how many time have uh, has flown uh, between two between both that's a very interesting interesting question uh, i think it took me it took me a surprisingly short time from the end of the game jam uh, to release the first a uh, version that I sent to my game developer friends is kind of like, hey, here's a version you can test. That version still, it didn't, you, you were not able to like win the game. There was no ending, no credits, no uh, settings menus or anything like that. But it was still, it had like 80 levels or something. I think it took me like 
two weeks or one month uh, from the game jam to get into that first like non jam version of the game. Uh, but I think when it comes to having the first version that you could like beat that had the full process of the game, uh, that was ready only like half a year or a couple of months before release because I uh, I wanted I spent a lot of time considering like how does the game end? What is the ending? What is the cutscene? What is this story part of the game? Because I wanted to have some of that. Also, what is like secrets? What, what are the secrets of the game? And I had a lot of stuff to do elsewhere at the same time. So I kind of worked on other things as long as I could. And then when I got an idea for what to do with the ending and with the secrets and stuff, I moved on to those. So I kind of, it was only at the very late stage of development that I kind of implemented those very last parts. So depending on what the question specifically means, it's either like a month or uh, almost two years. Uh, but but what what was actually the the version that you consider to be more than just just the um, uh, uh, concept of uh, proof of concept? Sorry, uh, is it the the version you presented uh, at the um, um, at the Lilo event you you won, or is it the uh, the version you presented when you you started presenting the game in the, during events? Was it later? Uh, I think I think uh, for me personally. Uh, well, first of all, when I had finished the game jam version, I didn't like start from scratch on the final version. I kept uh, like working on the same project file and just updating things. So I think uh, when I got to the point where I scrapped some of the like some very big early pieces of code and rewrote them to be uh, like more dynamic to work better for me when I was kind of at the point where I felt that okay this could be a final system for like for example reading the rules uh, I think I was already at the stage where I felt that okay this is not just a proof of concept so I would say that even that like first version I sent to my game developer friends a month after the game jam was already something that I okay this is I'm, I'm going to build this into the final version of the game so yeah it's I don't, I don't usually do the kind of thing where I make a prototype and then I start something completely new from the prototype. Obviously that does happen, but I seldom like intentionally do that. So for me, usually if I'm working on something, I'm working on it with the idea that this is going to be the final product. Yeah, it was, like, it was more like uh, more and more improvements uh, as you went. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. like ob obviously sometimes that leads to huge problems because I'm like, I've worked on a game for two years and there's some early thing I made, which is horrible. And I, then I cannot change it anymore, but that's kind of how I like to roll. <laughs> I can understand that. Uh, there is another question from Louis Godard. He says, uh, I really like clever puzzle games. Uh, he also says that he is a huge uh, Braid and the Witness fan. And I got hooked up quite uh, quickly with uh, by Baba Is You but I feel things are getting... Uh, sorry, I, I don't have my glass, so... Um... All right. Transformer sent. Grandma Mary can uh, now read. Uh, but I feel things are getting really difficult and crowded at some point. And sometimes I feel discouraged to continue. What advice would you give me in order not to feel overwhelmed by the apparent complexity of some puzzles, apart from uh, just give up? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, that is one of the actually actually should have mentioned that during the presentation. That is a, something that became a problem in some situations because, uh, as mentioned, especially in the more complicated levels, I need to have more restrictions to kind of well, like if you could solve every single level by just breaking the wall, is stop rule and walk through walls, that would get less interesting over time. I feel so. I wanted to make the end game puzzles kind of prevent many of those alternative solutions unless the alternative solutions also include the twist I wanted to introduce in the level or, or are like interesting in some other way that I feel that kind of justifies the existence of the alternative solution. Uh, and uh, I had to scrap some levels and I've been like readjusting many levels uh, as I, even after release of the game to reduce the amount of rules in some levels because I've noticed 
even during development and especially after release that some levels, even if the idea is interesting, even if the puzzle is interesting, uh, there's that overwhelmingness problem. Like you see a huge sea of rules. They might not be complicated rules, but you still have to keep them in your mind. You have to kind of internalize the rules of that specific level. Uh, and that gets problematic when you have like 10 rules at the same time. I tried to avoid that, but some in some situations, I felt that the puzzle idea was cool enough to justify the amount of rules. I don't know. I might have done some bad calls there, but that's kind of how I try to think about it. As an ad, a piece of advice, I recommend uh, thinking, looking at the rules that you cannot change. Usually they are kind of along the walls of the level or they are enclosed inside walls uh, and kind of see if you can see some patterns in common rules. For example, in many levels, flag is win, baba is you, wall is stop. Those are maybe the most common rules that are applied to those uh, words. And if you can see the rules that you can never change, you can see that there's wall is stop and flag is win up in the corner, they are surrounded by wall walls. In most situations, those rules are immutable. So it might make it easier if you can look at those, realize that, OK, in this level, flag is win. So flag is what it usually is. Wall is stop. Wall is what it usually is. I cannot change the rule, those rules. And I can kind of ignore. I don't have to look at that corner anymore. I can know that flag is what it usually is. Wall is what it usually is. And that's fine. So that kind of uh, it might help make the level seem less overwhelming if you can just, OK, I know what flag is. I know what the wall is. I don't have to think about it anymore. I can just keep that part in mind and not look at that corner. I, I feel that that has, like some Let's players I watch play the game have done that, where they kind of look at the level, see that, OK, that thing is what it usually is. That's good. Uh, that's less overwhelming now. Um, uh, just um, I, I was just wondering because actually, like uh, like Louis, uh, I I'm stuck in a, in an advanced level. Actually, I've been stuck for ages. Uh, anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, is there any any way to uh, is is there any uh, way to get some help to get them some hints or uh, maybe I don't know some uh, um, um, solutions uh, official solutions somewhere did you did you think uh, about this uh, is there a way to be is there to have hints or uh, help yeah, so, of any kind uh, not, not right now there's a guide on steam that i might be up to date there are i think for every single level there's a youtube video of i think someone actually registered the youtube channel baba is you that is not me but registered that and uploaded uh, like solutions for every level so there are many unofficial ways to get solutions uh, after release uh, because baba is you released at the same time as sekiro and sekiro caused a lot of discussion about game difficulty and like a gating uh games so that only accessibility like yeah. only stuff. skilled players can see the whole content and how it it's nice to have accessibility options and so on uh baba is you baba is you's difficulty kind of came up sometimes in those discussions and something that I considered at that point, I, I tried to have as many accessibility options as I could within the limits I had when developing the game. But something that I considered at that point was adding a hint system. One very nice suggestion was that uh, in the when you go to the pause menu, you could activate a hint, and that would so show you like some, not the final solution, but some like intermediate. Uh, configuration of words so you know that in order to get to the end at some point the level has to look like this I like that idea and I kind of put it in my head as a kind of oh yeah this I will implement this at some point but after that I've been so busy with fixing bugs adjusting levels working on the level editor especially for the past like half a year or over half a year that the hint system has kind of it's in my mind, it comes to my mind every now and then, but I haven't really been concentrating on that because I felt that I need to do these other things first. But yeah, it's it's something I've considered. Would be a great improvement though. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've got another question, uh, another question, sorry, from Exorciska uh, asking, did you try longer words like uh, nine letter words or four letter words were an obvious choice for you, an obvious choice for you? 
Yeah, so when I made the original game jam version, I used 16 times 16 pixel uh, grid. So the sprites were very small, only 16 times 16 pixels. And you cannot fit a lot of text in that space. So my original plan, when I noticed this, I don't remember in which order I figured out things. I think like I may, might have made the word lava first or as one of the first uh, words. And because there you, you can have like uh, four letters very nice, very nicely in every corner. I felt that, okay, I want to make it so that every word is four letters or less. So you have you, win, lava. Originally, the word water was actually goop because I wanted to have a word that is only four letters. Uh, I pretty quickly realized that that limitation is too much. I won't be able to make a very, like I have to use very odd synonyms for words if I want to have only four letters maximum. So I think water was one of the first words where I kind of broke that rule. Maybe not the very first, but one of the first words. And uh, over time, when I moved to the larger tile size, 24 times 24 pixels that the game uses now, uh, I kind of tested what is the maximum amount of letters I can fit in there. I think the longest word in the game right now is foliage, which is uh, it's seven letters. Uh, I could fit eight letters if there were some I letters or other thin letters in there, but at that point it would be already pretty difficult to even like read the word, like foliage is already kind of compli complicated. So I've tried to keep the uh, amount of letters as low as possible wherever possible. There's also words like without that will be coming up at, with the level editor that is also seven letters, but I don't think there's any word that is that will be eight letters right now. I haven't technically, there's no reason why I couldn't make the words wider except from like aesthetical standpoint, but so far this limitation has been okay enough. Um, I to to jump in uh, from this uh, question about words, uh, I saw a little little time ago that you were I don't know if it's still on if it's still a process or not but I saw that you were looking for uh, some people to translate actually uh, Baba is you in other languages and I just kept thinking um, um, is because the game is uh, made of a really simple uh, grammar but also it's designed like uh, functions or rules, as you as you call it. Um, is it language proof, actually, or is it really uh, limited to uh, a certain way, a certain grammar? You know, is it is it language proof? Like, uh, could you um, have uh, have you found a way to to uh, to apply it to every language possible? Uh, no, no, absolutely not. Like uh, in uh, after release in like April last year or something, uh, I sent a tweet asking for translators, and uh, we spent a bunch of time considering uh, considering if we could translate the rules, the like in-game rule system itself. Uh, because, for example, a friend of mine uh, mentioned that it would be super cool to have a Japanese translation where every word instead of having like several letters crammed into I was one thinking about title. Japanese when I asked the question actually. <laughs> yeah, there was like a single kanji for every every word or something like that. That would be so cool. But when we consider the different options, we realized that English is a language that has a has very lax rules in terms of like how words interact, what is understandable, what is the word order, and some other languages are way stricter about for example word order. And uh, after discussing it with some, some translator, for example, uh, with the Spanish translation, we spent some time talking about like different options. And ultimately, it seemed that uh, we wouldn't be able to, like there would be, would be no language where we would be able to implement the rule system without changing something. At the very least, we would have to make it so that the words change they're like a conjugation based on the context they are in because many languages outside of English have, for example, gendered nouns. And uh, when you say like Baba is you, you have to know the gender and you might have to change the word is based on the gender of Baba or rock or something. Uh, and that would be not, not super complicated, but like an extra complication that would 
be different in every language. An extra problem it's a tricky would obviously, process. Yeah, like it, it would basically would have required that for every language, we work very closely with a translator and we work with a translator who, who not only knows the language and knows the, knows the translation, but also knows, like for example, Baba is you is not grammatically correct English, but it's understandable. So the translator would have to know like what kind of uh, grammatical errors we can make that don't affect the readability. And uh, to give one more example, there's the word not in the game. You can say like ice is not melt, as I mentioned earlier, but you can also say not ice is melt, which means that everything that is not ice, all the other things but ice are meltable. So the word not can go in many different places. Can and it? in many other languages, not, you don't have that kind of a not that can go in many places. You have different words for different kinds of not. Uh, so yeah, it, it, uh, it would have been so cool, but I gave up on that. So right now the translations the game has are for the menus only, the like user interface, not the in-game. So. Uh, so I had a last question from uh, Dr. Imbrus asking, since you mentioned the initial concept of not melt, uh, did you try at any point to make the game with uh, the gimmick in reverse and thus having a isn't uh, word that would remove inherent properties that uh, item, uh, items have instead of only having blank items, items, sorry, um, on which you add properties? Uh, so as mentioned, even during the game jam, I already felt that objects not having intrinsic properties is more is cooler from an aesthetical standpoint than them having intrinsic properties so i kind of made this the the decision to go with that very early and kind of kept that approach throughout the whole process i did consider at one point the ability uh, to allow a level to have a list of intrinsic rules that are not on the level that just kind of always apply because that would help, for example, with the overwhelmingness problem. You wouldn't have as many objects on screen because you could just look at the list of rules. Okay, this level has these rules by default, and then there's the words. But that also felt like it would have broken the kind of design elegance of the game because then you would have the rules on screen, but also a different list of rules elsewhere. So I didn't want to do that. But as something kind of like that, uh, as mentioned earlier, as we have discussed, the rule text is push, and I think three other rules do exist intrinsically. For example, the map level selector doing what it does is another intrinsic rule. And using the word not, you can break those intrinsic rules. And there's a level, there's actually two levels in the game where the rule text is not push applies or is present in the level. And in that case, uh, Every time you say something is not something, the not takes priority over them being something. So in those levels, the intrinsic rule of text being pushed is actually broken by these uh, non-intrinsic rules. But those are kind of special examples. All right. Well, I think it was the, the last question. So maybe, uh, I don't okay. know if you want to add, add anything that we wouldn't have uh, thought of. Uh, I, think, I think this is, Pretty much it. I guess I'll I'll come to the Twitch chat, and if someone else has more questions after this, I will be there answering them. But uh, thank you so much for having me here. It was very nice to give this presentation. I had the last question uh, actually. Where, where can oh, we follow your work on the internet? Uh, I think I think the easiest way to follow my work is either by following the Baba is You Twitter account, which is Baba is You under dash, or following me on Twitter, which is ESA Devlog, because my first commercial title was called ESA, Environmental Station Alpha. And, but yeah, yeah, so following me on Twitter is maybe the best way to get some news. And especially following the Baba Is You Twitter, because that's where I'm active right now, because I'm working in the level editor. But yeah, yeah, thank you very much for asking. Well, thank you, uh, RV, for, for this conference. It was brilliant. Uh, yeah, the game is brilliant you. too. Uh, thank, you, <laughs> thank, thank you for all of this. Uh, merci à toutes les personnes euh, qui ont suivi cette euh, conférence, que ce soit en live ou peut-être euh, en VOD. Euh, je vous donne rendez-vous euh, demain, euh, demain pour euh, cette troisième journée de la donne.